morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to City Hall, this er being here today. Um, my name's Naomi Kelly, and I'm the City Administrator for the City and County of San Francisco. And I want to welcome you all to the Tall Building Safety Strategy Summit. Um, I'm very pleased with the turnout this morning, so thank, I really can't thank you enough for spending your morning with us to, here today because this is very important what we're doing and talking about the resilience of our buildings in the downtown San Francisco neighborhood where, as you know, there are much, our skyline has changed and we see many more tall buildings there and many of those tall buildings aren't just office buildings but residential buildings and we are talking about the resilience of our city. Um, I'm happy to be here with you all today. This is a great opportunity for city officials, staff, experts, stakeholders to engage in recommendations set forth by the Tall Building Safety Strategy, which was originally released last October. I want to thank uh, Tom Huey, the Director of Building Inspection. Tom is right here. <laughs> Mary Ellen Carroll, who is the uh, Director of the Department of Emergency Management, who is right here. I'm not sure, I don't see her in the crowd, but she may be here. Uh, Kathy Howe, who is the Assistant uh, General Manager of Infrastructure for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. But the four of us really started working on uh, the resilience of our tall buildings, well, a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, and have spent a lot of time with the Applied Technology Council, the Office of uh, Resilience and Capital Planning, Brian Strong, um, to, and to really make sure that we think about uh, these buildings in a different way than we have in the past. Um, you all have a copy of the Tall Building Safety Strategy. It's the first of the, its kind in the nation, and it brings us together today. During the summit, you will hear from many people who care deeply about making sure our tall buildings and infrastructure is strong, but we also want to focus on an open public discourse. We want to focus on engaging you on how we should prioritize the 16 recommendations that were in this in the strategy. And we need to think about the next big earthquake. I say this all the time in almost every public speech, but I can't say it enough to remind us why we're here today, that the U.S. Geological Survey estimates that San Francisco will have a 72% chance of an earthquake of a 6.7 magnitude within the next 30 years. So we need to think about this on a regular basis and keep this in the forefront of our minds. Thankfully, we have a community of renowned experts to make sure these highly complex structures are well equipped and resilient for the safety of our residents, our workers, and our visitors. Again, thank you all for joining us here today. And now I'd like to invite a member of the Applied Technology Council, Greg Deerline, professor at Stanford and who has been our our guiding uh, expert on structural engineering to help us understand these tall buildings in San Francisco. Greg. Okay, well thank you Naomi for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I'd, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here today and report on behalf of the team of the Applied Technology Council who put together the tall building strategy and a more detailed report. They're available online and in your folder. Many of the members on that team are, are with us here today and in fact will be participating in the later panel discussions. Um, thinking about the, the plan itself, it really goes, has its history going back in the, in the work that San Francisco did. The Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety initiated some years ago, a pioneering effort to bring together earthquake engineers, urban planners, other design professionals, emergency managers, working with uh, officials in the city and communities in the city to think holistically about the vulnerabilities in all sorts of construction, infrastructure, and so on. And so this tall building project follows on that, recognizing that some of that action plan is looking at the performance of, say, existing buildings or new ones. How do you evaluate those, if, whether retrofits are required? And it's really recognizing that, that uh, Tall buildings are, are, and other special structures are unique. In other words, ways that you would inspect or think about a three or four story wood frame structure is quite different about a modern high, or an older high rise building. So that was sort of the, one of the genesis and motivation for the project. Uh, so when we got started, one of the first things was to get a handle on the tall buildings in the city. Here the, the city, again, San Francisco has been proactive with SF data, getting an inventory of buildings we kind of added on to that, looking specifically at tall buildings and focusing on those that are above 240 foot tall. 
There's nothing magic about that 240-foot number. That's a trigger in the building code for certain requirements. Uh, but in fact, any building that, you know, of that size or close to it, um, it could be important to look at. So this was part of the, this inventory, which is online, um, you know, categorizes some of the details, occupancies, and so forth of these tall buildings. And so some of the things that we looked at there, for example, were the, build, the occupancies in the tall buildings, recognizing that about half of the tall buildings are about our, our office occupancies. The other half are either residential or mixed-use occupancies. And that balance is changing over time. You might not be able to see the little heat map on the upper right hand of the slide. You know, basically the tall buildings are primarily steel construction that were built from the 1960s through the 1980s. You know, on the other hand, the proliferation in residential construction is more uh, reinforced concrete, often shear wall type systems. So the inventory thinks about the occupancies of the building. We also think about the structural systems. This is important for earthquake engineers to advise on the expected performance of some of the older buildings. So, character, so understanding are the buildings reinforced concrete or structural steel? Are they moment frame? Are they brace systems? Um, and this required work of going into the San Francisco DBI, looking at old drawings to pull out this information and bring it forth in the database. So one of the things in, now that we have this database is to think about the, the landscape of the buildings and to think about when they were built. So this graphic on the slide here is showing going through time from the, the 1960s up through the present, when different types of buildings were, were constructed. The ones that are green are steel moment frames, the ones that are bluish are steel brace frames, the reddish ones are various concrete types of buildings. And in thinking about their seismic issues, to think about some events that have happened. So for example, the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, this is one that was a big, uh, raised awareness of the hazards for, non, for concrete construction, what we now call non-ductile concrete construction. So thinking about, okay, when that occurred, building codes changed subsequently, you know, and if you look at this graphic, there were a few of concrete buildings built before that time, which would be of concern. I um, should point out there's many concrete buildings on the landscape built prior to this time, about 3,000 in San Francisco, which are uh, a genuine hazard. Uh, only a few of them are in the tall building inventory, but that doesn't uh, certainly minimize at all the hazard that those non-ductile concrete have to, to people in the city um, that inhabit them. Uh, another event is the 1994 Northridge earthquake. One of the things we learned from this was the uh, uh, steel moment frame system, some vulnerabilities in the welded beam column connections and a due to a host of issues on detailing practice, material toughness, and so forth, but raising questions about, say, the performance of steel buildings built before that time. Um, and then a third thing that, uh, that evolved is in the mid-2000s, uh, 2007, per modern performance-based engineering methods came on board, which should involve using advanced methods of analysis um, that really allows earthquake structural and geotechnical engineers to understand better than ever and be able to predict the performance of tall buildings and therefore ensure even higher levels of performance. So the, the inventory is sort of a backdrop um, to looking at some of the issues. So, you know, out of that inventory, there's sort of three cohorts of buildings that rise up. Uh, one, as I mentioned, the non-ductile concrete buildings. Uh, there's 12 out of the 156 in the tall building inventory, but again, we should keep in mind many, many non-ductile concrete of uh, below 240 that are, can be hazardous. Uh, steel moment frame buildings, there's about 86 on the landscape before the Northridge earthquake, about 65 of these are the moment resisting frames, kind of raising some questions about what their performance might be in future earthquakes. Uh, and finally, the last cohort is looking at the proliferation of resi tall residential buildings. There's about 24 uh, largely reinforced concrete. And we, we raise these just to sort of think about what issues that can occur in each of the buildings, depending on their occupancy, when they were built, type of construction, and so forth. Um, and in, in thinking about why do we focus on tall buildings, well, obviously, you know, these are important structures, large occupancies, but it's not just uh, the effect on the people in the building, that is, whether the safety of them first, first and foremost, but also if there is damage and people are displaced from an office building versus from a residential structure. Uh, but also how damage to a building can affect its neighbors in terms of if a cordon uh, or there's debris uh, after an earthquake, how that can affect emergency evacuation routes and how it can impede buildings around it. You know, for example, if there's a cordon, whether it would restrict access not just to the tall building, but the buildings in its vicinity. So these are some of the issues we uh, delved into as part of this study. 
So out of the study came 16 recommendations. I won't kind of review these all, but they were kind of in four major categories. The first is looking at what could be done for new buildings. Um, and one of the recommendations, uh, and several of these that formed the base of the discussion today were brought up in the, the mayor's executive directive, like prioritizing out of these 16, what are some important ones to tackle. One of the first ones is looking at the performance and design requirements for tall building foundations. This is one I think not a topic of the panel discussions today, but already DBI is working to develop the recommendations that were uh, recommended in this uh, report. Uh, one that we will talk about today, I think it's a topic somewhat of the first discussion, is to think should, new, should tall buildings be designed to higher performance levels than other buildings, especially thinking about when they're residential occupancies and so forth. So there's some recommendations on that. I actually have a couple of slides to show on that to kind of queue up that discussion. Um, oops, if I go back for a second. There's a host of issues on existing buildings. What could be done before earthquakes to address safety of existing buildings? This relates to kind of evaluation, potentially retrofit, also thinking about insurance issues and things of that sort. Uh, if we move forward in the third category, this is to think about what could we anticipate happening after an earthquake and in terms of evaluation of buildings, uh, and uh, well, and in particular, inspection of tall buildings. Again, a lot of the rules and requirements we have for inspecting buildings are sidewalk surveys. You know, walking by a two or three story building, you get a sense of its performance, but you can't do that in a tall building. So there's a number of recommendations there. I think the, the third session today will kind of focus on some of these, thinking about what can we do to facilitate uh, inspection of tall buildings after an earthquake, San Francisco has the, the BORP, the Building Occupancy Resumption Program, to think about can that be updated and perhaps even made a requirement for tall buildings to really facilitate quick recovery. Um, and also the, the safety assessment combined with the different agencies that could come into the city to help inspect buildings. So that'll be a topic of discussion this afternoon or later this morning. Um, and finally, the last group is looking uh, more broadly at things related to seismic risk. And one of those that'll be a topic of discussion today is a, a recommendation to develop a recovery plan for downtown San Francisco that has a lot of tall buildings, but of course they're intermixed with other buildings, and there's also infrastructure that supports those systems. So to sort of think about anticipating after an earthquake what's going to be associated with recovery and really trying to take measures ahead of time to, to hasten, you know, in other words, to be able to expedite things after an earthquake occurs to bring things back to normal. Now, I'd like to just briefly talk about that one uh, recommendation looking at enhancing the performance of new buildings, new tall buildings. And here we ask the questions of what is the expected seismic performance of new tall buildings? You know, building codes keep these buildings safe, but there might be damage um, that requires repair and it could displace people out of the buildings. And can and should the performance be improved? So this is a, a question being raised. Um, partly to inform that, we did a study together with the team looking at two kind of archetypical tall buildings, a 40-story reinforced concrete shear wall residential building and a 40-story steel brace building using these modern braces called buckling restrained braces. You know, what we found is these buildings designed per code, and we subjected them to a design level earthquake. This is one that might have a ground shaking, a, a probability of exceedance of about 10% in 50 year. It was the basis of the SPUR program, Resilient City, looking at that level of ground shaking. You know, and the building performance in terms of the damage was in line with expectations. But really what jumps out is the functional recovery time, which as you see for the, for the residential building might be on the order of five to six months and on the steel, moment, or steel office building, a little bit less, three to four months. But to, you know, if you think about the resilience of the city, apart from the cost of things, it's really the time to recovery that's critical. So really discussing these issues, that if those are recovery times and talking to the engineering professionals, they generally agree that's probably reasonable for what to expect. There's some disagreement on during that functional recovery time, will these buildings be able to be occupied, which is a bigger question. And that's a question that actually changes over time depending on societal um, values and stuff on the, you know, the safety and the performance of buildings, particularly tall ones where there's a whole host of fire and egress issues that are quite different than low rise buildings. Um, so part of that study is looking at first on this slide on the left, looking at um, for those buildings that five to six months downtime, if you will, you know, what part of it is associated with actually doing the repairs? And here you see it's about on the order of a month or so. But what stretches it out to the four or five months are so-called impeding factors. So this would be the time to 
you know, do inspections of the buildings, and if there's repair, getting, well, getting engineers on board to design the repairs, uh, getting permits for those repairs, getting contractors, financing, and so forth. And one of the recommendations is to look at ways to, even if the buildings, we don't go for higher performance of the building per se, what can we do to facilitate through programs such as BORP uh, reducing these impeding factors? And the ultimate goal being, and you can't, might not be able to read all the numbers, but this is in the report, you know, being able to reduce those functional recovery times, not by changing anything with the building, but looking at impeding factors. But then beyond that is the question of enforcing higher performance standards beyond the basic uh, California building code for the given that San Francisco does have a lot of tall buildings all in close proximity that serve important functions both for office and for residential. Um, so that's a quick kind of run through of that. Appreciate your attention and I think we'll kind of move on now to the, probably the first panel discussion. So thank you. Okay, our next panel is a discussion on strengthening building performance. Uh, I will be your facil uh, the facilitator for this panel. With us, my first guest is uh, John Hooper, who is with the Applied Technology Council, who has been another uh, gentleman who has been right with us at, uh, from the very beginning, thinking about everything on tall buildings. We have Angus McCarthy, who is the president of the Building Inspection Commission. We have uh, Mary Ellen Carroll, who is the director of the Department of Emergency Management, and Joel Copel, who is with the Planning Commission. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a very important question, and we're just gonna go straight down the line, and let's just get straight to it. What do you think is the most important task we can do to strengthen building performance? Um, oh, there we go. Now I'm on. Um, there's two areas that we could do. I, I, I can't do just one. Uh, the first one is we could improve the repair time numbers that Greg Deerline showed on the screen earlier by changing how we design tall buildings. We can affect that by reducing drifts and things like that. That'd be one piece. But I think the larger effort could be in on those impeding factors to. Um, reduce that time, because that's where the majority of the downtime comes from. So improving the BORP program and things of that nature will facilitate quicker recovery times and getting back into the building. So for me, I think, uh, because we at DEM are responsible for the safety assessment program and the coordination and resourcing for that, um, my, my recommendation would be to expand BORP as much as we can. It's going to, we'll learn more about that if you, uh, at the SAP panel later on, but to be able to accelerate uh, re-entry and ex assessment of your buildings, I am a huge advocate for BORP. So uh, on behalf of the planning department staff, uh, Director Ram and uh, President Melgar, I'd like to just thank everyone for showing up today and uh, let you know that uh, we are extremely concerned with public safety, the safety of our buildings. Um, uh, all over the city, especially downtown, and uh, our commission is uh, deeply committed to maintaining the integrity of our built environment. Um, obviously, uh, I echo every um, statement that's made here this morning, Angus McCarthy, and I just want to point out we have Commissioner Clinch here for any uh, serious academic questions that you might have, because he's our, he sits in our engineering seat, and we have Commissioner Walker who sits with the tenants. So thank you all for coming here this morning. Thanks for seeing everybody here this morning. Um, I sit on the builder seat, so we have a very uh, lot of roundtable discussions, particularly in the building community, uh, with escalating costs. And as you know, builders, developers, we complain a lot. How are we going to build these things at these costs and so on? But um, one thing, uh, as somebody who was in the 89 earthquake, who remembers it very clearly, the aftermath of that earthquake and the, the damage that was done. So educating the new development community on how important it is to come up with really strong policies and how we build our tall buildings is probably the most important thing we can do over the next couple of years. 
Excellent. And so we saw a, ver uh, a presentation by Professor Derline. Um, is there anything that really stands out that uh, we should focus on immediately and then maybe in the long term? And I'll just let anyone jump out. It, it could be anybody. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, the question is the difference between the existing building stock of tall buildings and the new building design. Uh, so they're, they're kind of separate buckets for me. And so how do we look at the, the ones that Professor Dillon mentioned about the cohorts of buildings from the early 70s to the 80s to what we do today? And uh, I think they should be looked at and recommendations are included for both. And I think uh, it's hard to de decipher because we can improve the new buildings incrementally. They're, they're a small percentage of what we end up seeing in the community. But all the existing buildings are out there, and there's a lot of vulnerable buildings that were mentioned by P Professor Durline that should have a look-see and see if we can improve their performance as well. And so uh, today's, uh, and having everyone here today is very important because existing buildings, there's a lot we don't know about. And so maybe Angus, with building inspection and uh, planning, uh, Joel, think about like, what would be, what would we have to do to try and from a city standpoint, with new buildings, it's easy because we can just set new regulations and build them according to those uh, building codes. But walk through some of the process of what we have to go through with existing buildings. Well, well, I think a lot has happened. Um, ever um, the department, the DBI, obviously have been very committed to to, to safety. That's our primary concern. And over over the years, like um, Administrative Bull in eighty two and eighty three, which goes back all the way to 2008, was introduced. Um, I think that kind of sends out a strong message. We've been on this for quite a while. Lately, uh, we've issued S18 um, for those geotech, if there's geotech people in the, in the audience, is a, is, is, a, is a big ask of the development community, but we're asking for two forms of geotech um, analysis on, on, on buildings and so on. So we are moving as fast as we can. It's kind of, uh, on a monthly basis, we seem to come up with new policy and procedures that would be good. Obviously, it takes time to implement them. But the Department of uh, Building Inspection is doing everything it can to keep on top uh, of changes and evolving uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis, particularly when it comes to the tall buildings. Yeah, as far as planning is concerned, we, we do have a pipeline of uh, upcoming uh, tall buildings. We've been recently ap approving tall buildings, and whether it's a commercial or a residential or a hotel use, we take that into consideration just because uh, there might be different life safety requirements, not just as the, the structure of the building need to be built correctly, but also uh, the, the life safety systems within the building need to notify people if there is an accident. And uh, uh, coming from uh, the electrician, um, we, we, work, we always worked hand in hand with the fire department uh, for our life safety inspections with uh, exit signage, egress uh, routes, and emergency lighting uh, to make sure the buildings are safe to be habited at first and then safe to stand. And I think, Mary Ellen, I, I, in thinking, at it, thinking about this from your head as Department of Emergency Management, kind of think about uh, we if we have this earthquake, what happens with our downtime, downtime if the building doesn't get back up online within a time period, and how does that affect our recovery? Right, and so I think one of my favorite recommendations in the report, even though one of the most daunting, is the downtown recovery report, or uh, study um, that we need to do. And, you know, what I think about is, um, our downtown has grown and diversified so much recently. It's not just financial and, and commercial. We have residential. We have more hotels. And so um, it's, it's so critical that we look at all of these issues about the performance and then what we're going to do both kind of in the immediate aftermath um, and, uh, and, then, and then how we recover. Um, some buildings may perform well, but are not going to be accessible because buildings around them have not performed well. Um, and so I think that the, and the other thing is that we have the time frame for potentially getting buildings back online, but I think we need to look a little bit deeper into the uh, 
whether those are, ac- are real or not, depending on debris removal that we have to do, lifelines restoration, there's a lot of sort of um, competing and interdependent um, factors that go into our recovery. So um, this is incredibly important, and I'm, I'm not the engineer or the technical person, but we all need to work together to make sure that um, our, our assessments and our planning are uh, interdependent, that we're looking at those interdependencies. And actually, you know, thanks to uh, your leadership and, and uh, a lot of the work out of the city administrator's office, we're doing just that. Thank you. And while I'm asking questions up here, I'd ask all of you to start writing questions down to start passing forward so that you can, um, that you can ask the panel as soon as we finish here with our, our conversation. Um, uh, and there's a gentleman in the back, Bill Barnes, and Tal Ketone, who has, uh, you can, they'll pass out cards for you if you're interested in asking questions of this panel. So, Other areas that we've been talking about, we've been talking a lot about, especially in downtown San Francisco, is the geotechnical. I know we we have a lot of structural engineers, and I think we've got that down, but we've realized uh, in the last couple of years, the geotech, the foundation, we live in um, a city that has different types of soils, just within a few blocks radius. I know, uh, Angus, you talked about the administrative bulletins and the information sheets, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about what that means and how we think that through going forward and what what different processes that we might start thinking as a city. Uh, Great question, and that was one of the recommendations in the the first set that Professor Dillon showed. The process for improving how we do foundation and geotechnical engineering is underway. DBI has already taken that under the wing, and that process is Actually, a first draft is available and then it's being scrutinized by the, the full geotechnical community and the structural engineering community to help raise the bar, if you will, of how geotechnical engineering is done to make sure that we're well-founded in a very diverse geotechnical area here, as, as which is stated. It, it can vary greatly on the same city block. And so, uh, thankfully, that effort's underway and, and, and hopefully that will be done in, in the future of foundation and geotechnical engineering will be improved by that effort. Okay. Any other thoughts about that? Um, really, just to, to conclude, um, the department is doing very, very good work in that area. And I, I see my son there who's intern here. And if there was ever a job to be going after in college, I think it's geotechnical if you move to San Francisco. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge I see is we don't have a, a bigger pool of geotechnical. You know, and that's a real challenge. Um, as somebody who built the first building in South Market back in the, in, the, in the late 80s, I learned a lot about geotechnical and the, the softness of the soil. And it was a small building. It was only a four-foot building. But, but I was always really blown away by the expertise of the geotechnical ability to create a foundation that's going to work in very difficult. And here we are now with the tall buildings again, and we're asking the same from that community. I think they are very, very huge part of us getting this whole thing right and um, we need more geotechnical engineers there's no question about it Um, in the the development world we uh, have a very small pool to go to um, and that's something I think uh, is another part of this equation I'd love to see more increase uh, in those professionals thank you I wanted to just take a second to uh, thank Mayor Breed and the leadership she's been providing we've been recently hearing presentations on sea level rise um, uh, she's also starting to address our, our climate change issues and making our, our buildings uh, a little more uh, you know, energy efficient downtown, but at least we're having those discussions uh, on a public level that'll help us all uh, just gain knowledge and, and know more for the future. Excellent. So some of the questions I've gotten from the audience and um, we can talk about is where is the U.S. Geological Survey in this conversation? And what is being done about the continued areas of liquefaction in Mission Bay, China Basin, the Embarcadero? Um, let's take the first one, the U.S. Geological Survey. I know they're part of our conversations. I don't know if they're here today, but um, I know uh, the, uh, the um, Office of Resilience and Capital Planning uh, has regular conversations with them uh, and have been part of our, our conversations, not just here on tall buildings, but in our earthquake safety implementation program. And we, uh, we're very much involved in our soft story retrofit conversations and uh, 
are, we are working with them on a regular basis. As for like our continued areas of liquefaction uh, in Mission Bay, China Basin, the Embarcadero, we've had conversations about it, uh, downtown is now growing and people now consider Mission Bay uh, downtown. And so um, I just, even watching the Warriors games, they keep saying on the news, and so the Warriors are, this is their last game in Oakland and they're moving to downtown San Francisco. And I'm like, that's not downtown, that's Mission Bay. Um, but they announced it over and over the last couple of weeks. So uh, we've had conversations. I know Mary Ellen was the first one to bring this up. I don't know if you wanna have thoughts about how we take this work. Do we focus right now? Do we scale it around, how to, uh, scale it to other neighborhoods? What are your thoughts around this? Um, around uh, liquefaction or just in general. Yeah, I mean, I think that both. <laughs> um, we, uh, we have done a lot of great work and planning around our response, um, the immediate response. But really, we're looking at a recovery uh, discussion. And, we're, I, and I'm so happy to say that we are just on the precipice of kicking that off. Um, also because that discussion goes well beyond the city. We've, and, and that's why you're all here. Um, we are only 30,000 strong, right? <laughs> and um, we've really got to get everybody involved in this conversation um, about, we want to understand what you need to know from us. We want to understand what your assumptions and expectations are. Um, it, will, uh, it will fire us and force us to really dig into more into some of these discussions. For me, I think um, the issue of lifelines, and I'm looking at Lori Johnson and other people here who've done a lot of work on this, um, really our ability to get in back into the city and to work is so critical. And so moving through the steps of response and recovery, putting these in some sort of order. Um, because as I mentioned before, you can't do building assessments if you can't get through the streets uh, necessarily, although drones are, are an option. But there, I mean, there are some options, but um, you can't house hundreds of engineers, geotechnical, civil, or structural, if you don't have a place for them to stay and power and water. So, um, so I think that this discussion has to, you know, it's global and we have to look at each, each section of our city, um, both as a whole, but, but separately also. So, so those are the things that I'm thinking about and I'm really looking forward to that I think we're gonna make a lot of progress in this recovery plan on. Just recently, uh, this, uh, this question came in and we talked a lot about it at our Lifelines Council meeting, um, or m talked about it. Um, there was a recent New York Times article about the use of base isolators, um, which by the way, San Francisco City Hall is on base isolators. Um, and Japan uses them a lot more and the New York Times article said California is not using them as much. And, and should San Francisco be looking into that approach too? I like to think since San Francisco City Hall is on base isolators, we are thinking about it here in the city of St. Francis, but any thoughts from the panel? Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the article did a nice job, I think, painting what the issues are and, it, and the benefits of base isolation. I think most engineers on a project will offer that as an option to the owners. Uh, it's not always taken uh, mainly because of the the challenge of, and the cost associated with them. And so that's kind of the impediment that we see here on the West Coast that is different than we see in Japan who uses it quite a bit more. Uh, and I'd argue that for the tall building inventory, the isolators aren't, won't be as effective because of the nature of how those buildings perform naturally. It's, it's a better fit for buildings like this that are you know, robust and strong and stiff. And so that's a better play for that. But, uh, Certainly we could do more, especially for those buildings that are, want to be essential facility basis, like hospitals and emergency operation centers, et cetera. That's where they're best implemented and you'll get the performance that we really need out of those structures. I have uh, some good questions here about, even if the tall buildings survive, and it goes to the interdependency issues, that I'm pointing to Lori Johnson, who did our interdependency study. Um, what about the streets? What about the infrastructure around the streets? What about even if my office is open, will I, be, will I have daycare? What is all of the recovery issues? And so I, uh, 
what are, if we have a lot of thoughts about that, but Mary Ellen, do you want to jump in? John, do you want to jump in? Angus, all of you, I think this is a good one to think about how we're all interdependent upon each other, our streets, our roads, our gas, the economic recovery. Uh, I, I can't get to work if the train system is down. I can't get to work if I have no place to send my kids and family. So, Well, I mean, starting from the beginning, one of the things that I think about, especially downtown, is getting people out of getting people out of Dodge, right? So um, if it happens during the week and we've got hundreds of thousands of visitors and people that work here who need to get across the bay or on a plane and to their family, to their homes, um, that, that's sort of the initial and that, that's, that's a huge lift right there. Um, again, the, the conversation has to be um, multidisciplinary. Um, this tall building study I think is is so um, unique and innovative is because it's really diving into this, these complex tech, technical issues that is pushing these other questions. And um, again, we have a number of different uh, initiatives. We have our emergency response initiative that responses and plans that uh, the Department of Public, or DAM is responsible for. We have like a 400 page debris removal plan. Um, but then we have lifelines, and now we have this. And the connection I, that I feel that has been missing has been to the broader community, to our, to our residents, to our um, businesses, to really bring you all into this discussion. Um, we're all going to be affected. We want to keep, we want you to stay in San Francisco, or if you have to leave, some, we want to bring you back as quickly as possible. And, you know, um, the late Mayor Ed Lee rings in my head all the time. A year and a half, shortly before he passed away, we were in a meeting, and he said, this is his legacy. And it is, and it's all of ours, um, to, to really come together, and, and we've, we're finally there. Like, we're at such a good time. So, I, so again, this is the beginning of discussions um, and real, the real work that's going to bring us together to find the solutions we need. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning the late Mayor Ed Lee, because this is all the culmination of the work product that he started when he was mayor and that he truly cared about um, Lifelines Council, our restoration timelines, our recovery effort, the tall building strategy. Uh, he asked that we do this, and so thank you for mentioning the late Mayor Ed Lee. Okay, so next topic. What about buildings like 181 Fremont that went above code? Why can't we ask all new buildings to go above code? Is it the, what are the barriers and what are the costs? I know that gets very technical quickly, but at a high level, and I know there's, very, there's a lot of technical people sitting in the audience who could probably answer that in detail, but this panel, thoughts? There, there, there's a, there are requirements in the San Francisco Building Code and in their administrative bulletin 83 that really cause those things to happen. So uh, hats off to DBI again for that. Any building over the 240-foot height limit that you want to take what we call a code exception to, you want to do something that's outside the building code, mainly make it taller than it, the code might allow, requires us to do a more sophisticated analysis, more sophisticated design, and with that comes a peer review panel that helps oversee what we do to make sure that the engineer is doing it as best they can. That includes people like Professor Deerline and other academics that help us make sure that we're getting it right. So it's a, it's a natural cause of doing that process that makes the tall, I, I would argue, safer than a code prescriptive design that doesn't have that additional layer of, of goodness, if you will. Uh, there's a cost to that, though, like you mentioned. Uh, the cost is not exorbitant, I don't think. Uh, and so the question would be, how, how many buildings? You know, what buildings are important to take on this additional level of design and oversight and review? That's a, that's a discussion that should be had by the city and the, uh, the developers and the owners, et cetera, to see if that cost would be worth it. Um, as a builder and developer, I never have done a peer review. My, uh, my projects have never kind of met that criteria. But I, I've always gone out of my way to talk to developers who have gone through that process. And at the end of the process, they are happy, uh, the two that I did talk to about it. Um, and I think if they're happy for one reason, they now can go to the world and say, I probably have one of the finest plan check buildings this side of America. And I think that's a huge 
thing for people who are in the world of selling product and selling buildings. And I even see it now in the advertisements and the, uh, when they're selling their buildings, they go out of the way to talk about the structural issues and how this building was built. And some of them say, we're at bed. Uh, it's, it's interesting. So I think the, the, the developing world is embracing the, the extra work, uh, peer reviews and so on. And, and are using that to tell the world that they are you know, moving into one of the most solid buildings built that can be done uh, in, in this day. So, uh, When it comes to codes, you, know, you have to remember that uh, codes are the bare minimum. Um, we're always going to encourage people to, to overbuild things. We can't make them. Um, but being in this city, this is the city to overbuild something just for longevity. Um, and you know, we're not going to ding you if you don't overbuild it, but um, we encourage you to. Okay, go ahead. I just want to add one thing. This is not really on the, the agenda, so I'm going off a little bit. But, um, okay. but, but uh, and, and we're going to be talking about this at Disaster Council on Friday, but we also are dealing with climate change, is change issues. And so I know this is, we're talking about seismic here, um, but, but I actually truly believe that climate is going to be just, just you, you can guarantee that that's coming, actually has already arrived. And so that's another area that... I think as a city, we need to be looking forward um, to making sure that our buildings are um, habitable for, for a different kind of cli climate than we're used to. Thank you for that, especially since we had a very hot, hot, hot week last week, and we're struggling looking for cooling centers and air conditioning and places for folks who live in San Francisco who don't have air conditions and where to go. Um, Here's a good question. Why is BORP not known among the architectural and engineering firms and building owners? What can we do to get BORP in the state safety assessment program more publicity, get more folks certified as inspectors, get our buildings? This is all part of recovery. Right now, BORP is a voluntary program, and people opt in and that those owners are deciding that they want to recover faster, they want to have their engineer be accessible quickly after a major event to help get their building back online. One of our recommendations in the initiative is to require that for buildings of a, of a certain height or certain criteria, and that would then publicize it, because right now the engineers know about it, the architects less so, and a handful of owner types do, but uh, it's out there, and certainly DPI knows all about it. And so we just need to get the word out and maybe follow up the recommendation and make it required for certain buildings, and we have to set that criteria what those buildings are. Um, I second everything that's said there. For me, learning about BORP, only, it's only the last year and a half that I got educated on it. I didn't know this program existed. And my first reaction when I heard about it, when it was walked, when I was walked through, was why, if I, if I own one of these buildings, these tall buildings, uh, why would I not have this? Um, and so I'm, I'm totally in the camp, and I might, I don't know how a lot of the development community feel about it, but I'm totally in the camp that this should be a part of requirement of uh, when you finish a building that, that you have Bork in place. Um, um, I think it's a no-brainer. I, I know there might be added cost to it, but I think the overall... Uh, 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 a result that you get from it in after a crisis, I think it's just, you just can't put a number on that. So I'm totally in favor of that. Please stay, stay for the SAP, the safety assessment uh, panel today, and it will make you want to uh, look into BORP, I think. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, you know, a lot more on like lifelines and what are our most important lifelines. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions like, what are we doing to hearten and strengthen like our, util our infrastructure around buildings? A lot of that is public. We have a 10-year capital plan that we're looking at, like our water, our wastewater, our, our streets. Um, but also, I think we learned a lot about this, about with uh, looking at Christchurch, New Zealand. What are we doing around like the shattering of glass and how it, after an earthquake, and how are we thinking about that too? Amy? I'll, I'll talk about it on the tall building side. Um, all the tall buildings that have been designed since Professor Irline showed about the mid 2000s, uh, the whole cladding design aspect of them is enhanced over what the code would suggest for a, a standard building. So we we thought about that, and so the cladding, including the glass, is going to be 
well, we hope it's going to be more resilient than a typical building. So we've already put that into the, the rules, if you will, for the tall building. So we're doing better because of that. And we didn't, unfortunately, need the lesson from Christchurch. We, we, that was thought about almost 15 years ago. And so we are doing better uh, because of the rules that were in place since about the mid-2000s. Uh, again, really, really happy we're having this discussion today. Um, I think BOMA's doing a really good job leading the way, uh, setting themselves up to succeed if and when something like this does happen. I see a lot of uh, building owners and managers here today, and uh, a lot of those buildings are existing in, in older or historic buildings, and I just want to you know, make sure that, that um, they have time to implement these processes, um, whether it be windows or, or whatnot, soft stories, structural issues. Um, these owners will need time to uh, to fix their buildings and make them uh, more healthy for the future. All right, so there was um, a lot more questions that came in, either I couldn't read the handwriting or uh, they got very technical. So there, there was a lot on uh, a lot of DBI codes and whatnot. I just wanna point out uh, the DBI team that's here today. So if you have more questions about that, they're right, look, they're all sitting down. They're at this table right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, please like, come over and ask those questions. But I got a very important one, and this is the reason why we're all here today, and I would like everyone to kind of talk about this. What we don't want to do is, you see, there's a lot of recommendations, and the 16 recommendations that um, were our best educated, very highly educated, learn it thoughts. But we don't want to do this without getting the input from the stakeholders. And so one of the questions which I thought would be great that we'd end on is, how would you help to inform the planning department, Department of Building Inspection, the Board of Supervisors to implement policies that are based on facts and data? Um, there's a fear of some new policies that only serve short-term political agendas. That's not what we want to do today, and that's why we are here um, to have these conversations. So uh, from, you have the building inspection, the planning department, Department of Emerging Management, and the Applied Technology Council as our academic experts. <laughs> this is their question. So please, could, would you respond? Um, again, I wanted to uh, thank our department. We have a, a robust department that's uh, constantly working, doing a lot of the legwork for us, addressing these very issues. Uh, we see just the tip of the iceberg on Thursdays when we hear these items uh, at the commission, but I, I'm very confident that staff is working with all different departments throughout the city and the mayor's office to ensure that, that we're looking at and improving the, the healthiest buildings we can. Um, that's always a very loaded question. You know, as a, as a builder developer, again, I keep wearing that hat in the commission. You know, we're all trying to do the right thing. And I, to, to the departments, um, particularly in DBI, we get a lot of great ideas, but honestly, we get a lot of bad ideas too. And um, we entertain the bad with the good, and then we try and do our best to process. The unintended consequences is always something that we talk about in our commission, particularly when we have so much stuff coming from planning and what they're asking of us and how it works with our code here. And we're always asking ourselves that question. So uh, the best qu answer I can give to everybody is everything is really hashed over. So if uh, policy or, uh, uh, is changed and if the code changes, we like to believe it's for the better and we have vetted it as best we can. We also always put language in there. If something is not working, we can go back and revisit it and, and clean it up. And we do a lot of that as well. So we do our best. Are we perfect? No. We love input, and the, the, the biggest problem we have sometimes with some of these policy and procedures that we change is we don't get enough of community input, even though the staff do an amazing job outreaching. It's just, it's hard to get people's attention and everything and figure out what the unintended consequences of some of the decisions we made, but we can always reverse if we have to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, I, I, I agree that any decisions we should have should be data-driven. Um, we still have a lot more of discovery to do around what data inputs we need. And um, again, the, these kind of forums, this type of report is just the beginning for us to start digging in deeper. And I think, again, many of the initiatives that we're already, we've already begun, our Lifelines uh, Council, this process, um, and then through the emergency management with many of our partners and expanding that is, is the direction we need to go in. 
I'd, I'd add some real quick is that being part of the applied technology team working with these departments, I was impressed with how interactive and involved in the whole team was. So I see good things ahead because of that interaction and, and, and the buy-in for the report and the recommendations so to date. I can't see it not going forward in, in, in the right way down the road. Well, I just want to thank these panel members for uh, taking your time out to be here today. Thank you. So while this panel changes out, we have another panel session, and then we'll take a break. So keeping you riveted on this stuff. Uh, we want to talk about the downtown recovery plan and framework. Mary Ellen Carroll will be back up again to give an introduction. She's going to get her next notes. <laughs> um, but we do want to say that we have brought some experts from Seattle and Santa Rosa here to be on this panel. And they are coming up. Brian Strong is coming up to the stage. Barb Graff from the city of Seattle. Sean McGlynn from the city of Santa Rosa. And Lori Johnson. While our panel gets settled here, um, again, I'm Mary Ellen Carroll. I'm the director of the Department of Emergency Management. Um, here in San Francisco, one of the reasons why we're here, um, our philosophy really is that we want recovery, and we believe that recovery is going to be most successful when we as a city, and when I say we as a city, that's we, um, are in the driver's seat. Um, and so I really applaud all of you for joining us here to help us um, go in the right direction in there. Um, last year, Mayor Breed asked uh, City Administrator Naomi Kelly and I to establish and lead the city's disaster recovery task force. This task force places the city and our community in charge of our own destiny in how we will influence and, and to be the influence um, and not have outside influence in how we want to rebuild this city. This is, um, includes our neighborhoods, our businesses, and our infrastructure after a disaster. So again, thank you for being here to take part of the driver's wheel with us and help us along our way. Um, to help us guide this discussion, we have assembled this wonderful group of uh, experts um, who have researched, planned, and also have witnessed um, firsthand the realities of disaster recovery. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Dr. Lori Johnson, who I've already shouted out to, has nearly 30 years' experience in urban planning and disaster-related consulting management and, and research. She's written exclusively about land use and risk, disaster recovery and reconstruction, and the economics of catastrophes. She's co-authored many things, but uh, two noted after great disasters, an in-depth analysis of how six counties manage community recovery, and the other is clear as mud, planning for the rebuilding of New Orleans. Dr. Johnson is a visiting project scientist at the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center at UC Berkeley and also chairs the National Advisory Committee for Earthquake Hazard Reduction. Uh, Sean McGlynn is the city manager of Santa Rosa. Thank you and welcome to San Francisco. Um, this is the lo fifth largest city in the Bay Area as well as the county seat of Sonoma County. Uh, Santa Rosa has about 175,000 residents and an annual operating budget of $324 million, including a general fund of $148 million. In October 2017, a series of wildfires caused devastation throughout the North Bay. The Tubbs Fire spread through the city of Santa Rosa, and more than 2,800 structures were burned in Santa Rosa with an economic loss of $1.2 billion. And as city manager, uh, Sean has first-hand knowledge of the time and resources it takes to recover from such a catastrophic disaster. We're lucky to have you here to learn from you. Um, Barb Graff, my friend Barb Graff, is the director of the Seattle Office of Emergency Management. 
which is responsible for the city's all-hazard community-wide emergency management program. Since 2005, the city, Seattle Emergency Ops Center has coordinated a citywide response to 16 major exercises, 50 incidents, eight of which were resulted in a presidential declaration. So they're beating us right now <laughs> on that, on disasters. Uh, Barb and her team also developed the C Seattle's Disaster Recovery Plan, which provides the framework for how the city recovers and rebuilds from disasters. Um, and so we're very happy to have you here to learn about that process. And finally, my colleague, Brian Strong, is responsible for the city's 10-year capital plan, its capital budget, and the implementation of the Resilient SF Strategic Plan. Brian has implemented a number of innovative resilience programs to protect San Francisco's infrastructure, thank you, including the Earthquake Safety and Emergency Response Bond Program, the nation's first sea level gu guidelines, and the first building by building has this seismic assessment. So Brian is gonna be here to facilitate this and kick this off. Thank you everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to be facilitating this panel. And uh, again, I think if, if there are questions and so forth that pop up, you want to write things down on cards, you're welcome to. Um, but I just wanted to, to sort of start things off with a little bit of, let me see if this works. Okay, it does. All right, just a little bit of uh, background here. Let me see, that looks like, where are we with the presentation here? Framework. There we go. All right. So I think there were some questions already in the first panel about recovery and what do we do about all the different aspects of it, the interdependencies, um, the, the communities and those, those folks. This diagram here, which was sort of put together, I, I think initially uh, may have come out of FEMA, but I know Lori has commented on it as well, sort of shows how, what recovery looks like. You know, you have these different cycles around immediate response, sort of then the midterm and the long-term response, and Mary Ellen and I have had lots of discussions about, you know, when does, uh, how do you coordinate your response with your recovery? The reality is there, sort of this longish one, the, the long low oval that comes over is your recovery process. Um, and, and again, this comes from our, not only our experience, uh, you know, with the 06 earthquake and the 1989 earthquake, but also experience with a lot of the other hazards that we've seen around the world. Recovery, if you want it to be effective, needs to start immediately. Um, it also means your response needs to be effective, but you want your recovery um, to get started immediately. And as, as you begin to recover, you, as you begin to sort of address the response, you'll see that the recovery activities pick up more and more, but they can be there for as long as five, 10, uh, you know, we're still seeing recovery activities in New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, now, 10, 15 years later. So that's part of the trajectory there. One thing um, to keep in mind is that um, we know that the early decisions you make in your response or in recovery have a big impact on the decisions later on. <clears throat> and I think Sean can talk to some of those, those impacts for what, for what they faced in Santa Rosa. Um, the other thing is the decisions that you're making in the community. And I just want to emphasize that we've talked a lot about building owners. There are also lots of people now that live in these downtowns, as Professor Deerline mentioned. These are residential places. They're also right next to residential communities, like Chinatown here, um, or, or if we talk about Mission Bay, or, or Soma, Central Soma, where there are a lot of residents living. And what are the impacts on them And thinking about how you incorporate community input and feedback into the process? Um, and then we also know what's critical is the speedier that you can sort of address your recovery, I mean, the speedier you can implement some of these changes, the faster that you're, well, that you're able to sort of get back to normalcy, that you know, economics are able to recover and so forth. You know, and some of the examples, you know, I, I, in Northern California, we were always criticized a little bit because it took us after the Loma Prieta earthquake a long time to figure out and replace the central freeway. Um, we did it, it's part of its Octavia Street. We also replaced the, the freeway along the waterfront. It took us some time to think about and make those decisions, whereas in, Earth, in uh, Los Angeles, when they had the Northridge earthquake and the freeway went down, they made that decision almost immediately, I think within a couple of days, that they were gonna replace it as is, and that freeway was reconstructed extremely quickly. 
Um, again, those are different approaches. It worked well for Los Angeles to have that constructed quickly. I think in San Francisco, it was really important for us to take our time and make sure that we got it right. Um, not to say one way is better than the other way, but those are the implications that you have. Uh, just wanted to, again, we do have some folks from FEMA here as well. Uh, I know Forrest Landing is in the audience uh, somewhere around here. So, oh, there he is, right here in the middle with the knee brace. Uh, e easy to find. You may have to come to him. And uh, FEMA has been doing a lot of work in this area. They put together the National Disaster Recovery Framework. Um, it guides, it's a guiding document for jurisdictions across the country. Um, describes roles and ro roles and responsibilities and coordination, uh, and it's reorganized around recovery support functions. Um, we've we've been looking at these recovery support functions, and and Barb from Seattle will talk more about these um, and about their plan. But that that that's really what we built upon. I mean, we we really looked to Seattle. In fact, there was a lot of discussions. Couldn't we just take Seattle's plan and, you know, wherever it says Seattle, just cross it out and write San Francisco? Um, that was that was not an appropriate. We are not going there, Naomi. But uh, that is something that we that we were thinking about. But Seattle again has lots of different rules and regulations compared to San Francisco. We're a city with a lot of commissions. We have a lot of different authority. You saw members from the Building Commission, the Planning Commission here. Um, the idea of sort of creating a, a, a framework where decision making can happen separate from the regular decision making is is a it's something that we would that would take a lot of time, potentially a charter amendment. That's something that, that we as San Francisco would need to think about a lot, but we want to get going on this. Uh, this is the outline for a recovery task force. Um, this is nothing is in place yet, but this is what we're talking about for San Francisco. And the idea is at the top, um, you know, you certainly have your community, um, <clears throat> you have your community members, you have your city manager or city administrator in our case our head of emergency management that are making a lot of the early decisions. Um, and then you have these recovery support functions. We have elected officials. Uh, and then we have a lot of the folks that are here today, community organizations, business organizations, the private sector. Um, and then these support functions are laid out in the bottom around these different areas that need to be coordinated uh, for, the, for, for us to have an effective response. And that includes community um, coordination and capacity, economic recovery. Uh, one of the things we note is that we're, we're expecting probably 14, 15 billion dollars in damage just from uh, a 7.0 earthquake, a Loma Prieta type style earthquake that would happen closer to San Francisco. So the economic impacts are significant. Um, health and social services, housing, clearly. Housing is a big issue in San Francisco as it is in, in the entire Bay Area. We're at a housing shortage now. How do we manage uh, the, the challenge of losing more housing it, should an event happen? Uh, infrastructure, we talked about that with lifelines. Cultural resources, we know our cultural resources, like our schools, are so important to keep people in San Francisco for them to come back. Uh, and then some of the building and land use decisions that we need to make. Mary Ellen mentioned climate change and, you know, do we want to continue to build um, high rise is an area that may be um, subject to a lot of sea level rise and so forth. Um, finally, the, the last part of this uh, that, we're, that we're emphasizing that came out of the report was to sort of take a look at San Francisco's downtown. We know it's unique. We know it's different than other parts of the city. We know it plays a critical economic role, not only in the, in the city, but in the region and in the country, quite frankly. And how can, we, um, how can we do some more work to sort of take this recovery framework and sort of test it out in downtown? So we're gonna leverage a lot of the existing work that we have. We're looking at some of the, um, the recommendations out of this report. We have our lifelines analysis work. We have our 10-year capital plan that's looking forward. Um, and how can we put some of that information, some of the economic analysis that we have together to formulate a, a recovery plan for downtown um, that we can actually use, we think, um, as the basis for looking at recovery across the entire city. Um, and then I should also mention, you know, we, we, this will probably come up with the, in the SAP BORP conversation as well, but how do we sort of test these things and make sure that we're ready for when this event happens? So having said that, I can get to our panel to sort of fill in a lot of the gaps um, that I covered. And one person I wanted to start with was, uh, was Barb Graff from Seattle. 
and, and have her talk a little bit about their plan and, and the challenges that they faced and, and how they overcame them. And Barb, your plan is, is pretty thick. There's a lot of really good information in it, but I know it must have taken some time to, to put together. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. So San Francisco has a 72% chance of, of a major earthquake in 30 years, right? Ours is 86% chance in 50 years, so I think Mariana and I ought to start a betting pool, and whoever wins pays the mitigation of the other city. How's, how's that work for you? <laughs> um, we, uh, we started our recovery planning work um, about four or five years ago, and this was a, a, a um, double-phase, multi-year effort. Um, and Mary Ellen mentioned this in her comments earlier in the first panel, and that is we spend so much of our time and energy and resource trying to refine and improve our response that we never get around to doing recovery planning. Um, so I complained about that a lot to our city council, who believed me. It helped a lot that Christchurch, New Zealand happens to be a sister city of Seattle, and one of the best investments we ever made was to send two of our city council members to Christchurch. And when they came back, said, so... How, how is that for you? And uh, funding started to show up, and council was interested in some briefings, and uh, we, we made our way along. It was also relatively um, um, the same time period that the, the uh, federal government was coming out with its national uh, recovery framework. And so we decided, since a, a big share of assistance needs, needs to flow through the partnership that is the federal government, the state government, the county, and the city, um, we'd like to mimic what it was that the, the federal government had put in place. I think they put some really good time and energy and planning into that. But we did recognize that there's a couple things that happen at the local level that doesn't happen at the federal level, and so we amended the RSFs just a little bit. Brian talked about the recovery support functions as, as being major categories of infrastructure and housing, et cetera. Um, Seattle added education to the recovery support function three, because unless you get the schools reopened, it's a major domino to getting people back to work and ju just a sense of normalcy again, as well as a, a place of safety um, for the kids in your community. We also added an, a, rec a recovery support function um, seven, there are six at the federal level, and that has to do with buildings and land use planning. Again, something that doesn't happen at the federal level dictated at the local level, but very important to us, especially because we want to take advantage of any opportunity that we get to improve things. So when we put our recovery plan together, um, we imagined what if this is a relatively simple, straightforward recovery uh, process, um, which really mimicked what we experienced in 2001 with the Nisqually earthquake. For the most part, we just needed to repair, restore, reopen, re-everything. We didn't do much reinvention. But we recognize the fact that because of the three different types of earthquakes that we face, including possibly the biggest this country will ever see with a Cascadia subduction zone, we also need the opportunity to use a recovery framework that takes advantage of the opportunity to just change major things that there will never be the emotion or the resource to do until that time period. So we kicked this off with about four, different, four dozen different types of agencies, neighborhood groups, the Urban League, BOMA, the Downtown Chamber, et cetera. And we envisioned, we looked back to the past to inspire us about the future. So Seattle, like San Francisco, had a very large fire in the late, in the late 1800s. It um, burned through our timber town downtown. So we learned from that. We built back with unreinforced masonry. <laughs> but nothing's going to burn down there. Um, the other thing that the, that the uh, city founding fathers did at the time, which was really interesting for the time, because only about 45,000 people lived in Seattle at the time, they built back the water system to serve a million people. It was an opportunity that there's no way in the world anyone would have funded that at that time period unless what they'd just gone through was painful enough to really make the lesson sink deep. Um, we engaged in a series of different community conversations then, once we put people in that kind of mind frame. I think the thing I gave them was, if you had the opportunity to move I-5, that's never going to happen except after the biggest possible earthquake. But is the port of Seattle in the right place? Or would it be more efficient if it was a half or a quarter mile to the south, et cetera? So think big also. 
So what we created in our framework was how can we repair, restore, reopen quickly, but how can we reinvent if need be? And then we had a series of, of community conversations, just like today, which I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of, um, where we asked people to debate and discuss with one another, but we also made sure that people didn't pay attention only to those areas where they were the obvious subject matter expert and wound up getting some of our best ideas from people who just noodled around the idea uh, in what, what we call the gallery walk, an exercise I think you'll be participating in a little bit later today. That's what we did for our recovery framework. We have not yet used it. I told Mary Ellen it's, it's a little humbling to come talk about a great recovery framework that hasn't actually been used yet. But I will say um, we learn from every single disaster. As a matter of fact, in the creation of this, we learn from Hurricanes um, Irene and, and uh, Katrina, from Superstorm Sandy, from the earthquakes in New Zealand, Chile, and Japan. And we will continue to learn and continue to refine because a framework is never actually done. Yeah. Thanks, Barb. I know, um, I, I know we are really excited to, for Sean to be able to come here uh, from Santa Rosa because of the devastating fires that had happened there. And one of the, the strongest memories I have was getting up there, Sean, and meeting you and, and learning. I, I think you, you sat down with us and said, well, apparently I'm the recovery manager. I have authority. And, uh, and I think you've you had to wait for the city attorney to weigh in on that, like we typically do with a lot of our decisions here. We have to wait for the attorneys to clear the way. Um, but tell us a little bit about that and your experiences and chair. So um, the number I'm going to start with is 3,000 because it becomes the essential part of our question and our recovery process. Uh, you heard it was, uh, you, it's over 2,800. It was 3,000 residencies destroyed. We already had, as most people in the Bay Area have, a housing crisis. We had a um, vacancy rate of 2%. So if you're going to have 3,000 uh, homeowners or landlords displaced in one catastrophic event, and it was a lunar landscape that you encountered out there in those neighborhoods, um, you've got a major problem. Uh, we tried to lean into that conversation as quickly as we could, and that became our touchstone. How are we going to solve this issue? And if you're dealing with a lunar landscape, um, you've got to clear the debris first and foremost. But we also started to ask questions about how we were structured. That's the reference Brian is talking to. Um, I, I had the, the great opportunity to actually work with Lori during those those, those initial months of the recovery process. And we also asked the question as it relates to how do we fit into the disaster recovery framework? Um, what, what we lost in that fire was planned development, single family homes for the most part. There was some other uh, uh, damages. There was a, um, a, a manufactured home park but most of our losses were single family home. You're, you're, you know, the question is what kind of visioning exercise are you gonna go through? Very quickly we understood that the visioning exercise was about getting people, in that part of the community, was about getting people back in their homes as quickly as we possibly could, providing the pathway. We started to understand that most of those folks were insured. Um, whether they're insured enough is a slightly different conversation, and we partnered with our friends at Policyholders United to try to help those folks understand the gap in their insurance. But our visioning exercise was already pointing toward our downtown core. And again, these are questions you're constantly asking, how you fit into that recovery framework, how you're going to adapt to it. You know, you, you want to do a visioning exercise, but you want to do the right visioning exercise. We weren't going to be reimagining those neighborhoods. We had 3,000 single homeowners. Most, remember, only 1% have developed a property from scratch. They have no experience. They bought into a planned community. And we had to start visioning to understand that. So we restructured in a way to meet our need, which was what Brian said, we, we added workload, or correctly, I added workload to existing staff. The county went out to hire staff to do additional work. 
I knew if we were, I was competing against the county to hire staff in an, an environment where there isn't housing, there's already diminished resources, that wasn't going to meet our needs immediately. So we took the consultant route. We went out and we actually hired firms to help us in this process. And one of the early decisions council made was to help advance and make a bet on those single family home recovery by investing in a firm to stand up in the a month after the fire, stand up a office that was solely dedicated, completely staffed by consultants. We managed the contract, helping those folks in recovery. And I will tell you, those first two months were, were tough, tough because the only thing that was happening is people were coming in to get advice. They weren't starting the permitting process. We were banking on permits to actually fund this. But that was a really important part of this conversation, creating space for these folks to have a conversation and actually understand what their, what, what their options are and how to move forward. At the same time, we're meeting with the developer community and saying, how do we clear the pathway for this? And we're going through, the at the time, the largest single debris mission in the history of the state of California. We knew we couldn't move until we got the debris issue solved, and thanks from our colleagues at FEMA and Cal OES and the incredible work of the Army Corps, six months later, we were almost 90% done with debris removal and really into the permitting process. So remember that 3,000 number? Right now, two-thirds of those properties are in the permitting process. Over 400 are reconstructed. We're able, by focusing on downtown, to get a, down, get a grant from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission to do a specific plan process around our downtown where we could start to ask those visioning questions. Um, we're not probably going to go up uh, you know, 25 stories, but we're, we're looking at between 15 and 20 in the downtown area to really change the footprint because that's how we're going to think we're going to meet our long-term housing need. But it's again, it's asking those specific questions about your circumstance, your structure, your economic environment to try to find the solutions that best fit your community. Right now, it, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a challenge for all of us. It's especially challenging for mid-sized and smaller cities. Capacity issues exist, experience levels exist. And I'm working with the Institute of Local Government to try to develop some guideposts or, or cheat sheets to help think about these issues. Love my friends at FEMA, but they're not subject matter experts in management. And that's often the biggest gap that I find when we run into these issues is they can help you on recovery, but they're going to turn around and ask you this essential question is what you would do if we weren't here. And I think what they're saying is what's your management approach to this problem? And you've got to think through those things because, as was said earlier, those decisions you make early on are going to impact recovery and they're going to impact how you go about things. So we had a commitment to rebuild. Now we're facing issues where we're going to have to update ordinances to allow construction. We've got some neighbors complaining that the street lights back, aren't back in, but that was the choice. We're going to help you rebuild first, and then we're going to worry about our infrastructure second. We still have those community conversations, and those first, those first six months we had over 150 public meetings. We're now at a space where we're trying to build resiliency with neighborhoods. We're, we've partnered with your team down here in the uh, uh, Neighborhood Empowerment Network to really begin that process. Every Saturday we're having a meeting about a neighborhood where they're doing asset, asset mapping around resilience. And then we're trying to get them enrolled in our alert and warning systems. The thing I'll leave you with is, you know, we just com completed our after action report on response two months ago. And I will tell you, that's a choice, right? You have choices about what you're going to address. We got a little lucky because the county did theirs first, which gave us breathing space. But by not having to tackle some of those things early on, it actually gave us something to report out about all the successes we've achieved instead of just having a laundry list of deficiencies. And 
but that's not the usual course of action. Some people go right for the after action, but that's why I'm trying to say those decisions and where your focus point is gonna be are the critical parts on the recovery train and understanding your community, understanding the economics, and having the benefit of having some advice from people like Lori really helps too. All right, thank you, Sean, yeah. Really um, tremendous stories there. Uh, passing it on to Lori, I mean, I think Lori, and by the way, she won't plug her book, but I will, so it's right up here. Uh, and we're counting on this shooting to the top of the New York Times bestseller after today. Uh, but the, you know, I think Lori in this book, and she looks at disasters all over the world, we know we can learn a lot from Japan and some of these other countries. One of the things I, I notice is sort of this emphasis on process um, over, over thinking about recovery as a process as opposed to an accomplishment. But I guess that's something I would want, want you to touch upon too, is like, do, you know, do we ever know when we, is recovery ever done after a big event? And anyway, I'll pass it to you. Interesting, interesting place to start yeah. <laughs> at the end. Um, what eventually happens is kind of where New Orleans is now, where um, the landscape really looks like uh, like it did to an extent in terms of activity, um, like it did before the, the disaster hit. So you're always still gonna have these problem areas, you know, the areas with blight or the areas that need some, some regeneration or redevelopment attention. Um, and that's eventually kind of where you get to with recovery in most cases, is the easiest stuff gets done first and the harder stuff takes longer and some of it just eventually just becomes part of normal planning processes again. But in that immediate aftermath, um, you know, what is, I'll, I'll first share a few things that are sort of theory about disaster recovery. The first thing is that um, a disaster basically cre creates a simultaneous loss of capital, stock, and services. And so what that does is it really changes urban development activities. From that moment in time, everything is sort of compressed you have to make a bunch of decisions. You have to do a bunch of plans for different systems. Uh, they're all interconnected to each other. You need lots of money. It's not coming at the right time. Uh, so we call this phenomena time compression, that disasters basically from the standpoint of urban development and normal urban development and management, um, th the place of disaster becomes different from, from the normal place in, in that special way. And so really, the challenge um, for disaster recovery management is to figure out how to manage that time compression. And we feel there's sort of four levers for, levers for doing that. Um, the first is uh, obviously money. <laughs> um, and when that money comes, how it comes, how it gets used and purposed is really important. The second is information, because what really is happening is just a tremendous amount of uncertainty that all of that simultaneous decision-making, planning, and acting um, requires. And so the more information that you can provide is kind of like another fuel for the process. Um, and the third is, is basically collaboration. Recovery is very different from response um, in that uh, response can be a very command and control kind of traditional approach uh, to, to taking action. People are willing to sort of suspend governance for a period of time and allow for that control. But in long-term recovery, in a really catastrophic event, you have a multitude of stakeholders. You have all sorts of actors that sometimes I kind of relate it to like being a symphony conductor, that basically the best recovery managers are those who begin to recognize how to play and draw out the best of their very complex and diverse orchestra. Uh, and that's very much the same way um, with all the different kinds of stakeholders. So now I'll put that in the context of downtown San Francisco. Um, we are gonna have a good amount of money um, because these are fairly well insured buildings, at least the new ones, but we're also gonna have lots of places where there isn't money or the money is coming from the federal government or in terms of reimbursement for utilities and things like that and it's gonna take time. The second is information, and that really is gonna be informed by the kinds of plans and thinking that we do now, and the ATC study, I think, has really raised some amazing um, points for the city to consider um, in putting together some of these um, requirements for, for repair standards for different building types. 
for thinking about issues like whether or not we would have to cordon off um, a, pure, a part of the downtown. I love Greg's and the ATC studies picture where it shows sort of one tall building and it's got this huge area around it. Um, well, that's what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, uh, is really, um, and I think there's an important story there, so I'm gonna di digress a little bit to tell the Christchurch story and then come back to, to my comments about planning. <clears throat> the cordon went up in Christchurch after the second major earthquake. And part of the reason that cordon went up is because some of the buildings that were heavily damaged and injured people in the second earthquake had been inspected through the safety assessment program after the first earthquake and deemed to be okay and occupiable. So that was a really traumatic risk management decision uh, that then played out with 185 lives lost in the downtown area. So the cordon went up in large part because of the uncertainty that was created in that moment of not expecting to have such a large aftershock, uh, not expecting buildings that had been in expected to be um, unsafe after all and actually have collapsed. Uh, and the fear that these things would happen again and not knowing if that would happen like, you know, in the next 10 minutes or when. Um, so imagine that that kind of, if we don't take those steps now to begin to think about resilience and retrofitting and the work that we're doing in San Francisco, um, imagine the uncertainty around certain kinds of buildings that we're going to have after an event. and. Um, and if we're surprised by that, um, the fear that's going to be um, induced to, to protect public safety. So the cordon in the central business district uh, lasted over two years. And it uh, was essentially the size of downtown Oakland. So if you can imagine all of downtown Oakland from Lake Merritt to 980 and 880 to, I don't know, Broadway, uh, well, I guess 580 almost, like that was the initial size of the cordon. Uh, and it was eventually shrunk over time, so that whole area was allowed, people were allowed access. But what that did was it created tremendous uncertainty for building owners. Um, so while people had insurance and had money, um, they didn't really know when the cordon was going to be lifted, they didn't know what the repair standards were going to be. Uh, for the recovery, and they, um, many people with insurance companies began to have those conversations around, should they wait? Should they hold that money and wait? Did the insurance, wants, insurance companies want to hold that money and pay you once you finally got your repair standards? So a lot of buildings, be, uh, building owners began to make decisions to tear their buildings down uh, because they felt that the standards that would be required would be really costly. It was, in, it was introducing a lot of uncertainty in terms of timing, and they could do other things as developers with that money for two years. Um, and the, the other part too was that many of these buildings were older and they were no longer uh, attractive in terms of the market. You know, these weren't class A buildings uh, for rental anymore. Uh, and so this was an opportunity which these kinds of situations create to go to Barb's point. You know, the damage will in, in part inform the opportunity for transformation. Um, so without having kind of thought all that through, a lot of decisions started to happen of people tearing down buildings. So a lot of buildings were torn down because they were so heavily damaged, but a lot of buildings were repairable as well. And we don't really have good data on that, and I'm looking at Jack and Greg and others, you know, but it's still my sort of missed opportunity in Christchurch in terms of study is really, could we have done a better job of really understanding what buildings got torn down that could have been repaired? And we have to think about how we want to deal with that here. Do we want a large, massive urban redevelopment project? Or do we want to actually replace largely like for like? Because that kind of goes back to Barb's point about, um, or I guess it was your point about the freeways, um, where in Northridge, they replaced like for like. In San Francisco, we took time to replan. And, and changing, any kind of change in disasters essentially is an exponential amount of time if it's not well thought through and managed. Because you have to take that time to plan. You have to involve stakeholders. It requires information. Um, to do that kind of, of decision-making. And then you'll get challenged again and again, like you did with the Central Freeway, and you'll flip back and forth in some cases on your decisions. So um, with that, I want to kind of close with um, what I think is important about planning, um, which was written by the first people who studied lots of disasters around the world. Um, and they said, when disaster strikes, there is already a plan for reconstruction indelibly stamped in the mind of every affected resident, the plan of the pre-disaster city. This is the first recovery plan, 
and all previous plans or new plans made following the disaster will undoubtedly compete for many residents with that first plan, oftentimes intensely. So I commend the city for undertaking this effort because it's really important to get this stuff right. I also want to caution for everyone, though, that the kind of st stuff that Barb is talking about and what the National Disaster Recovery Framework outlines isn't really an operational plan. It will set the rules of engagement, but it won't be a physical plan, per se. It's not going to be a plan that's going to like decide right now what's going to get torn down, what's going to stay. But hopefully, it will allow us to set up the, the rules of engagement. How will we actually make those decisions? How will we transform from this amazing recovery, I mean, response structure that the city has, which, by the way, we took one step after Hurricane Katrina and we expanded the response plan to be a response and restoration plan. So it's getting us a little further down the line in terms of carrying us over, but there's still this awkward transition that always happens between the response structure and a recovery structure. So that needs to be thought through. That's what a recovery framework can allow us to do. And then it will allow us to also begin to think about how to make those tougher decisions that are going to come about. And I also just wanted to add, in terms of the downtown, besides Accordant, I think some of the major issues, as have been raised, are about the fact that this isn't just about businesses. This is about people living down there. This is also about very old infrastructure. And I think we have to look at the earthquake as, or a major event that has a lot of ground failure conditions um, potentially with it as being um, a, a, not just an opportunity to transform infrastructure, but essentially a requirement. We're not going to put back that really old, horrible stuff that we have that's under capacity for the needs of today's financial district. Uh, so that is a big part of what we have to be thinking about now. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, no, thank you, Laurie. It's great. Yeah. Uh, a lot of food for thought there, uh, for sure. And, and I think sort of touching on what you, what you ended with there, which is in many ways talking about some of these equity issues and how you're addressing community and those types of folks in your planning. And there was a question that came up around that as well, which is, um, you know, what are we doing in these plans um, to include residents and local nonprofits, um, community organizations, those types of people, many of who, who aren't even in our downtown, but are coming from, from various parts. It could be in the, of the Bay Area. We know this is a regional issue, but it could also be coming from other parts of San Francisco that really depend on downtown for their livelihood, um, for their jobs. Uh, so I'd like to get some comments on that. And, and then especially, Barb, I know when we looked at Seattle's plan, we looked at the number of community engagement and community partners that were in that plan. I think it was four pages worth or something of community organizations. Um, but how do you sort of bring community into this process, I think, as far as developing the plans, but also in the, in the implementation afterwards? Uh, first, I should say our recovery uh, framework, and as Lori mentioned, it's a framework. It's not a detailed plan because we can't detail it until we know exactly where the damage is and what has survived. Um, and it's on our webpage, so seattle.gov forward slash emergency under plans. You can, you, can you can find it and improve it by sending me your suggestions once you've read all the pages of it, as a matter of fact. Um, we teach over 250 personal preparedness programs to, to more than 10,000 people every single year. And before we started our recovery planning, we asked our public outreach staff to start answering, asking the question, everywhere they taught, whether they were talking to big business or the smallest neighborhood um, or the, the nonprofit. Um, so once the earthquake is over, what do you imagine your personal role is going to be in recovering? And people usually start with their own personal story. Everything starts with story. But then it became a matter of, so how, how do you get the food bank back open again? Um, how, how, how much glass do you expect there to be in the streets on, on your way to your, your high-rise office, et cetera? So we started planting the seed early with everyone we talked to. Um, and then when we started thinking of the actual invitation list of who we wanted involved in our community conversations, um, every single person that accepted the invitation, we said, great, will you, and we had dozens and dozens of them, would you give us three other names of people we may not have thought to invite? which helped us expand beyond the people that we already knew. And we, we had a pretty good network. The other thing I would say about um, our particular framework um, in terms of structure um, is that if you walk outside City Hall right now and just let your eyes scan the distance, 
recovery is not all about publicly owned buildings. It's, it, it's, it's, they're critical public buildings, but 75%, 80% of your recovery, um, as, as we learned from Santa Rosa, is, is about restoring homes and businesses and, and other types of infrastructure. So we've agreed that for our rec recovery support functions, those are gonna be co-chaired um, by a member of city government and someone chosen from the community and appointed by the mayor. Because recovery, re response is really how do you use the resources you own and you, you do the most good for the most people, et cetera. But recovery is about rebuilding and re-envisioning community. And so we need to keep people engaged. The other thing I'd recommend is just the power of story. Um, we invited the Christchurch mayor to our community, very public open forum, um, shortly after uh, their second earthquake. Uh, and let him tell his stories, very engaging person, um, majored in theater. <laughs> I think he majored in theater because he went into politics, actually. Um, he, he did a fabulous job of, of telling the story of what it was like to make tough policy decisions, get people involved, um, prioritize need, et cetera. And then two years ago, we, we brought back the current um, mayor of, of Christchurch to say, now these many years later, what, what else are you thinking of and what are you dealing with? When people tell their stories, people get it. When, when they read a document, they might understand. They scratch the surface, but the personal story makes all the difference. Yeah, great. And Sean, maybe talking a little bit about the community input after the event as well, and I, I know you've... I mean, you know, it is an ongoing um, conversation that we're having with the community. We, we as I said, we're starting these resiliency exercises in our neighborhoods but we still have a long way to go on even the, there's a thousand, if you listen carefully, there's a thousand properties that haven't begun the permitting process. And we have to better understand why, what their challenges are. Um, and a lot of them are caught in the, uh, the, they have insurance, but they are caught in the cost of rebuilding in the particular type of environment that we have in the Bay Area. Um, and we're trying to manage through that and better understand how to help them to fill the gap. And that, that's a complicated conversation, as Lori was saying, w timing on when funding flows, the criteria, what's criteria is attached to that funding. I mean, we did a Cal Home program um, that we kind of knew wasn't going to be successful, and we had to do it so we could demonstrate to the state and the federal government that the criteria that you've attached to our rebuilding effort isn't going to work in this particular environment, but you've got to have the proof to do that, and then you've got to have conversations about with homeowners who are in a great deal of pain about why this process inflicts it on, on themselves in this particular way. And so we're continuing to have that. We're going through some of the same efforts about how we build our own recovery framework. Um, like we're, fires is one of our uh, disasters. It's a whole series of things uh, that we all know in this area. Um, we're changing how we have that conversation with community members. And again, it's about what Lori says, it's about empowering those folks to have a say and how do they get to shape the future of their community and the future decisions that you're gonna have. And that's one of the most difficult things that I find as I go and visit other communities in recovery is letting go of that power and that decision making is a really, really tough things for subject matter experts to do. Um, and I will say we learned, it, we had a, a critical event that happened a month after our fire where we started to experience water contamination. And, and our team wanted to solve that issue ourselves. And it was only when we were able to invite the community in and really listen to their potential solutions that it turned from a, a second disaster and actually into a real community building opportunity for us. Uh, I, I, I can't say enough, that really changed how we were able to approach problems working with the community because we were, we were, gonna, we were running towards a cliff if we kept on our, our pathway without that community involvement and input. Yeah, and, and I should say, I, I know Daniel Holmesy was around here somewhere taking pictures probably for me. He's a, a, been a, a great partner in San Francisco and thinking about our neighborhood empowerment network and has worked with, with various communities uh, around the Bay Area and around the country and so forth. 
uh, and thinking about uh, also our NERT programs, our alert programs, and the importance that they have too, and I think identifying the different roles um, that those organizations play, and I think the difference between, uh, again, a, a residential neighborhood and a downtown neighborhood, and how are your commercial property owners, you know, working with the, the residents that may be right across the street or, or may be in the same building as a matter of fact, and do you have floor champions and as opposed to block champions and those types of things. Uh, Laura, did you want to add anything, I, I know, to this, uh, the, the issue around bringing community yeah. in? Well, I would yeah. add that um, I was at a meeting yesterday that was sponsored by Enterprise Community, the a national nonprofit housing developer, um, and many other things. <laughs> it's just a simple way to describe them. Um, and it was called Democratizing Disaster Recovery and Resilience. And uh, it, it, they had a number of, of uh, residents from Sonoma County who were there um, who are still very traumatized by what happened to them, not just because of the fires and what happened, but because of the recovery and the response and the way in which they were treated. Um, and, and I think this really kind of goes to the flaws in our, in our national recovery policy, so to speak. I like to say simply, uh, we haven't really in depth, re we did just pass this huge thing called the Disaster Recovery Reform Act. Um, but in terms of the premise of our policy, I like to equate it to that the really our, uh, the, the first law that was passed back in the 70s was sort of written t with the idea that everybody has insurance and we live in suburban Florida and a hurricane is gonna hit, uh, you know, and we're gonna build back, sort of like Santa Rosa, we're gonna build back essentially what we had. Um, so it doesn't really accommodate renters very well, it doesn't really accommodate complex, um, what I call land tenure arrangements, which we have in downtown. So condominiums, cooperatives, um, commercial, you know, structures that have residential uses and hotels and, and businesses all in one, um, mixed use activities, um, and just the density of, of, um, of, of urban existence, you know, it really, it provides the small amount that sort of, for individual assistance, that's sort of kind of like filling your deductible on your insurance policy, and then it provides for public assistance um, after, assuming that local governments also have some form of insurance. Um, and so when you don't have insurance, um, then you basically have a big gap. And so then there's, you know, what Santa Rosa is still going through, um, which is lobbying Congress and the state and others for forms of assistance. Um, and those take time, um, like we've seen <laughs> with this one. And so, you know, people do get traumatized. And one of the ways, I, very simply, I can uh, was traumatized by what I call the second disaster, which is recovery and the way we treat people. And the simplest way to say this is that I think our policy really is focused on assets and not on people and well-being. And, um, and, and until we begin to kind of think more in that context, um, and I love the term well-being, which uh, is really a very uh, developed term in, in New Zealand. They tracked it. They tracked dimensions of well-being, psychosocial health, um, access to jobs, your family life, all sorts of things in the recovery. I won't say that their policy was really that different, but at least they were tracking it. You know, so instead of just counting buildings, we really need to count lives and lives restored. And that's, that's a different framework than what we have right now. So I'd just like to follow up on, on what Lori said. That, that is, you know, I'm spending way too much time in D.C. and Sacramento, and often like FEMA can cover their ears. It's actually the state is talking to FEMA, and they're actually not talking to us. So that's one of the, the biggest gaps in the system. It's not geared to solving individuals. So I'll give you an ex a concrete example. Literally in D.C., arguing for extension of benefits as the benefits expire for renters. And we all know renters are a much more vulnerable population. FEMA extended the benefits for three months for homeowners, one month for renters. That, that is one of the issues that you're wrestling through. And, that, and I want to heighten that, that conversation I had earlier about setting up the secondary 
um, uh, planning department, which was just focused on it. Literally, those two months for those homeowners was coming in and having a therapy session with staff. That's literally what's going on in those first two months. No one's pulling a permit. They're going through therapy because there's no support mechanism. And that's one of the things, as Lori points out, we're still wrestling with is the anxiety, the fear, and, and the real inability to address individuals. And that's what we've tried to do in our organization is always ask that question of, of putting ourselves in the place and of those individuals going through that process. You don't know how many times I've heard, why are we arguing, literally, about 10 households? That's the conversations, unfortunately, you end up in these situations because while it's geared toward the local, it's your responsibility and there's a real gap in how the system meets local need and addresses individuals, and especially the most vulnerable in individuals who are our residents. Right. Great. I, this has been a, a great conversation. I think we could continue to have this for another hour or so, but we need to, to wrap it up. I, I wanted to recognize, you know, we also have some, you know, a number of private companies here, Salesforce, Apple is here, representatives and so forth, and I hope we're thinking about your employees as well, you know, as well. and I, I know they're doing a lot of work around that, how you're addressing their, um, the psychological well-being of them as well as the people in the neighborhoods. Barb, I don't know if you wanted to throw any last, have the last word here on, on advice for us or for people in the private sector um, in these areas. Just, just that planning never stops. Um, we, we would be very honored for you to take whatever concepts you can, because we took concepts from others as well. Like I said, um, we studied um, Sandy and Irene and Katrina and, and the earthquakes in, in New Zealand and Chile and, and um, Japan. Uh, we also hired subject matter experts. So one of our subcontractors was Dr. Gavin Smith, um, who in Katrina was the Mississippi governor's recovery czar. So he learned it um, through, through personal experience and then became executive director of a, a, a coastal resilience center. So just learning as much as you possibly can and incorporating it. And then what you commit to the page is not sacred. We, we've, we've made mistakes and bad assumptions, and we always need to amend them. And, and it's, a, a framework is not a contract. It was your best thoughts on that particular day. So uh, forgive yourselves and get better every day. All right. With that, I, I want to conclude this panel. And I want a quick word with people before, before you give your applause. And that is that in your packets, if you have not opened up your, your um, binders or your, your envelope there, there are six or I think there's eight different sort of areas that were identified.